Why is Dragon Roost Island such a bop? It's not easy to see why. There's no obvious hook, no extravagant chord changes or iconic melodic moments, and yet the fact of its boppery is undeniable. I think that the lesson to be learned from Dragon Roost Island is not one of any specific musical technique or idea, but of balance. If you had to describe the music without using music theory terminology, there's a lot of different words that come to mind. Is it upbeat? Yeah, it is. Is it melancholic? Yeah, it kind of is. It's a little bit wistful, maybe, but also undeniably energetic. If that seems like an odd combo, it is. The melody on its own feels almost contemplative and lends itself very well to a slower, more sober setting as was proven to us by the Breath of the Wild soundtrack. But that's not how we find this tune in its original form. The original setting is this jaunty 3-4 time with castanets, mandolin, and pan flutes grooving away, evoking the tropical island setting of Dragon Roost underneath that same melancholic melody. This kind of thing isn't uncommon in good music, putting together two great tastes that you wouldn't think taste great together. The contrast between the different layers of music creates an emotional depth. Looking closer, Dragon Roost Island makes use of emotional contrast in a few different ways in its rhythm and harmony. Let's take a look at some examples to show you what I mean. The rhythm is a perfect example. If you think about a bar of 3-4 time, there are two main ways that you could structure it rhythmically. The first would be to accent the quarter note. This creates a very energetic, bouncy feel, the kind of thing you'd see in a waltz, for example. The other way you could evenly split up each bar is by breaking them into two dotted quarter notes. This creates more of a 6-8 type feel, and it sounds a lot more laid back. Sit back and relax. These dotted quarters can go on all day. What Dragon Roost Island does is build a groove out of a two bar long pattern that alternates a bar of dotted quarter notes with a bar of straight quarter notes, mixing the two feels together into a hypnotic two bar loop. The mandolin that plays the main rhythm part is full of these little 16th note triplet flourishes that add a supercharge of rhythmic momentum to the accompaniment, and by direct contrast, the melody is always floating over top in these long dotted quarter note or dotted half note figures. Using different subdivisions as the basis for the different parts of the arrangement creates this web of interlocking rhythms that pushes the music forward, giving this piece a groove that feels great even without any kind of drum part. The harmony uses a cool mixture of light and dark side by side to create a complex and nuanced feeling. We are in the key of G minor, operating within a soft minor sound, meaning we're taking chords from the G Aeolian mode, no raised sevenths or dominant five chords in sight. The tune starts off with a G minor to F major vamp, the quickest and easiest way to evoke the soft minor sound I'm talking about. The tune is made up entirely of chords from the G Aeolian mode with two exceptions, a C major chord and an A flat major chord. If you think about the modes ranked from order of brightness to darkness, you'll see that one mode brighter than our home Aeolian would be Dorian, which makes use of the raised sixth note as its characteristic trait. One mode darker than Aeolian would be Phrygian, which makes use of the flat second as its characteristic trait. You'll see that the raised sixth, in this case E natural, is found in our C major chord, and the flat second, A flat, is found in this A flat chord. Dragon Roost doesn't establish a modal sound. It stands firmly in G minor and then branches out in either direction to add a greater brightness and darkness to its palette to create a more complex harmonic color. It goes even deeper than this, though. If we look line by line, we see that each phrase alternates between creating a dark harmonic resolution and a bright harmonic resolution. The first four bars of melody feature our G minor to F major vamp, which, as we've established, creates a soft minor sound. This is what I would characterize as a dark sound, though one that's more quietly sad than, say, brooding or anxious or evil or anything like that.
The following four bar phrase breaks up the pattern as we see this move down to F major followed by a leap up to B flat. This is a five to one move in the key of B flat major, the relative major to our home key of G minor. And this would be an example of tonal ambiguity, throwing us a bright resolution to a major key when we had already established a minor key sound. We don't stay happy for long, though, as this B-flat walks down by step to an A-flat, then to G minor. This flat 2 to 1 doesn't feel very drastic, but it does introduce the darkness of the Phrygian mode into the music. Just when we had made a little bit of a brighter move, we sink back down to an even darker harmonic place than we started. The final phrase of the section continues our stepwise descent to an F and then an E flat before jumping to a C major chord. Resolving on the E flat chord, the flat six carries a hopeful sound, and then the following move to the bright major four chord really makes it seem like things are looking up. But this four chord leads us to another A flat chord, which then drops us back off at our tonic G minor. I don't think you'll find this kind of major 4 to flat 2 to minor 1 cadence in any theory textbook. It's a pretty odd move, but I think it sums up this tune's approach to harmony perfectly. We're in G minor, no doubt about it, but there isn't one clear emotional tone that's being conveyed. I love the way the melody holds on this tonic G through this progression too, with the changing harmony around it just putting the same note in a new light each bar. It's like we're seeing the same subject from a bunch of different angles. It's moments like this that keep us engaged in a piece of music. Moments that make you think the music is going one way just so it can turn the other way unexpectedly. Even the very first few seconds of music give you the impression that there's more to this piece than you thought. We start with this little D major chord on the mandolin followed by two bars of castanet clacking before we get started on our main G minor vamp. The first chord comes and we think, oh, this is a major key piece. That was such a bright major chord. But then we settle into our G minor vamp and it's clear that that D was really the five chord and we were going to be in G minor all along. It's so simple, but these little moments where you realize you're not exactly where you thought you were can be so powerful in music. And using its relatively simple harmony in a very precise way, Dragon Roost Island can play with your expectations the whole way through the piece. It's kind of hard to say how this piece relates to the island as a whole, though. I could comment on how the energetic accompaniment mixed with the somber melody could represent how the first island you get to on your grand ocean adventure looks very colorful and vibrant, but it's really facing a number of problems that you wouldn't have expected. Every giant handsome red dragon you see has an evil centipede pulling his tail, as the saying goes. But honestly, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. To me, it seems like this is just a really solid piece of music written by someone who really knew what they were doing, and that's why it never gets old to listen to. It's not exactly a grand artistic expression from the depths of the human soul, but it is extremely well written, and it feels great, and that's enough for me. If you want to support the channel, check out my Patreon page. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.